Hello everyone, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and this is Virus Watch, the weekly video report on what's happening in the amazing world of viruses. If I handed you this tube and asked you to tell me how many Zika viruses were in it, what would you do? In virology, we're always measuring the number of viruses in samples. There are two general ways that we can do this. We can measure the number of virus particles, and for that we can use techniques like electron microscopy, which is time consuming and pretty expensive. We can measure the amount of protein with immunological assays that use antibodies, or we can use PCR polymerase chain reaction to determine how many viral genomes are present in a sample. These assays are quick, with the exception of electron microscopy, but they don't tell you how many infectious viruses are in your sample. Any virus stock contains a mix of both infectious and non-infectious particles. The exact ratio depends on the virus. For my favorite virus, poliovirus, about one in 300 particles are actually infectious. That number is higher or lower for other viruses. When we measure virus particles, we are determining the number of infectious and non-infectious viruses in a sample. Measuring the number of infectious virus particles requires an infectivity assay, and my favorite is the plaque assay. Here is an overview of how it works. First, we infect cultured cells with a range of dilutions of our virus, and then we cover the infected cells with medium containing agar, which is a jelly-like substance produced from algae. The presence of agar makes the medium semi-solid. This is important because when viruses are released from a single cell, they will be restricted to infecting neighboring cells by the agar. If the cells were covered with a liquid medium instead, the virus particles released from the first infected cells would go on to infect all cells in the entire culture, and we'd never be able to count individual infected cells. The formation of a plaque is shown in this series of drawings. You can see first a single cell is infected. Viruses released from this cell go on to infect neighboring cells and so on and so on, causing the zone of cell killing to increase in size until it's visible to the naked eye. Here's a time-lapse movie of a developing plaque. It was taken through a microscope, and as the cells become infected, they become shiny because the microscope light does not pass through them. You can see that over time, the cells are killed by virus infection, and the resulting plaque becomes larger as successive waves of cells are infected. I think it looks like what happens when you drop a pebble into a pond. After an incubation period, which varies from hours to many days, depending again on the virus, we remove the agar overlay. There's now a clearing where the cells have been killed by virus infection. These clearings are called plaques, and we can count them and express the virus titer in terms of plaque forming units per ml or PFU per ml. Let's now take a look at how a plaque assay is really done. We do plaque assays in a cell culture hood, which provides an aseptic environment to keep our cells sterile. Starting with a sample of virus, we make tenfold dilutions by adding 0.1 ml of our virus stock to 0.9 ml of medium, mixing and then repeating. How far you dilute depends on how well your virus grows. You wanna end up with between 10 and 100 plaques on each plate to get reproducible numbers. Next, we remove the medium from plates of cells and add 0.1 ml of each dilution. The cells have to be susceptible, which means they have a receptor for the virus and they have to be permissive. They have to be able to support the complete replication cycle so that new virus particles are made. We let the virus adsorb to the cells at 37 degrees Celsius for 60 minutes, and during this time, the virus particles are binding receptors on the cell surface. While this is happening, we prepare 
the overlay medium. Salads are usually grown in a liquid nutrient medium that contains a variety of salts and vitamins, amino acids, glucose, and we also supplement it with animal serum, which contains growth factors for the cells. The red color is due to the presence of a pH indicator. It turns yellow when the medium is acidic and purple when the medium is alkaline. For a plaque assay, we also add agar to the cell culture medium. At room temperature, agar is solid, so we put our agar stock in a microwave to melt it, and then we put the bottle of melted agar in a 45 degree Celsius water bath at which temperature the agar remains liquid, but it's not too hot so that it won't damage cells when we add it to them. When the virus adsorption time is over, we mix the agar solution with our cell culture medium, which has also been warming up at 45 degrees Celsius. We then add this mixture to each cell culture well. The plates are left at room temperature in the cell culture hood until the agar solidifies. Then we place them in the 37 degree Celsius incubator. This incubator contains 5% carbon dioxide, which acts to maintain the pH of the cell culture medium, which contains a carbonate buffer. After the correct incubation period, we remove the plates from the incubator and we add a solution of trichloroacetic acid to the plates to fix the cells to the plastic. This makes sure they don't come off in the next step when we remove the agar overlay. Finally, we add a dye to the cells, and we use a vital dye called crystal violet, which stains living cells. The plaques are then visible as clearings against a purple background, clearings where the virus has killed off all the cells. Calculating the virus titer is easy. In this example, there are 17 plaques on the countable plate. The other plates have too few or too many plaques to count. The dilution on that plate is 10 to the minus seven. The dilution of 10 to the minus six in the tube plus one more tenfold dilution because we only plated 0.1 ml. The final virus titer is 1.7 times 10 to the eighth PFU per mil. Today, many virologists feel that a plaque assay is too laborious, and they've switched to measuring virus particle numbers instead, mainly by PCR. But measuring viruses by PCR does not tell you how many infectious viruses are present in your sample. Only a plaque assay or a similar infectivity assay can tell you the number of infectious viruses in a sample. For that reason, the plaque assay is an extremely powerful technique. In my laboratory, we think that the plaque assay is so informative that we use it all the time, and we never use PCR to measure virus particles. In fact, this wall that you see behind me in these videos, I call it the wall of polio, is a stack of six well plates that we have used to measure the titer of polio virus. This wall is made up of 1,464 plates that were used for a single experiment done over the course of two weeks. That's how a plaque assay is done. If you'd like to hear about other methods in virology, send an email to me to viruswatch at microbe.tv. That's viruswatch for May 23rd, 2016. For more in-depth discussions about viruses, check out our science show this week in virology at microbe.tv slash twiv. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and I'll see you next week.